Robert Hutchings is Rostow Chair in National Security and former Dean of the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. He's joined by Jeremy Suri, who is the Mac Brown Distinguished Chair for Leadership in Global Affairs at the same school. And they join us today as co-editors of this book, Foreign Policy Breakthroughs, Cases in Successful Diplomacy. Gentlemen, welcome. I'm excited to talk to you about this. Thank you. And you, you begin uh, with a very modest uh, undertaking. Your goal is to reinvent <laughs> diplomacy with this book. Talk to us about that, that goal. Well, I think we were both motivated by the same kind of aspiration. We were concerned of the decline of diplomatic practice in our country and others, and we're con concerned about the lack of a real robust scholarship. So we're trying to address that in our, in our modest way. And one of the goals is to actually make diplomacy sexy. Unfortunately, diplomacy is not sexy in our society. And how do you go about that? Well, Dress well, it in lingerie? I mean, well, how do you we, <laughs> we thought of that, <laughs> but it didn't work out so well. Um, so there are three things we do in the book, I think, that are designed to make diplomacy more serious and more thoughtful for people. One, we have case studies. We try to walk people through events such as the opening to China, the end of the Cold War and the reunification of Germany, the Camp David process, for them to see how important diplomacy is. That's one thing we do. Second, uh, we try to connect diplomacy to broader policy issues. It's not just these cases. It's about the broader set of changes, the ways in which the international system has changed as a result of these developments, maybe changes greater than war. And then the third thing we do is uh, we try to tell a good story. Diplomacy is oh, always an important thing to do. Yeah. Well, well, with that in mind, how did you choose your case studies? In, a, in addition to them needing to be successful to meet the criteria, right. how did you choose the stories? Well, the first thing is we decided we wanted to do cases in successful diplomacy because so much has been written about diplomatic failure. We thought successes ought to be acknowledged and learned from as well. So we picked a, a variety of cases and case writers spanning the whole post World War II era some going back all the way to 1944-45, others bringing it right up to the present, uh, some involving the United States at the highest levels, others not involving the United States at all, in hopes that we could draw some general lessons out of these very different cases. We always say that war is the last option, but often it feels as if we're pretty willing to abandon diplomacy and start rattling the sabers. I think that's one of the problems, John, is that uh, war has become an easy tool to use for us, not because people go into wars lightly, but because we have such overwhelming military capabilities, and therefore we underanalyze the importance of diplomacy. And what we're trying to say in this book is that diplomacy is part of the effective use of war. War should not be something we resort to early. It should be something we use in combination with diplomacy to convince friends and adversaries to change their behavior. Countries are different, situations are different, so there's obviously no one size fits all. But I'm wondering if there are any commonalities that arise from the case studies that you've selected. Well, there's many lessons that came out of these cases that we tried to crystallize in our conclusion. One is leadership matters. Um, in every case we studied, it was effective leadership, and it all, wasn't always the charismatic world historical figure. Mm -hmm. Somehow it was quite ordinary seeming uh, men who did heroic things. Another lesson is the importance of strategic planning. None of these successes came without significant uh, prior planning, but none of the plans worked all the way through. All the plans had to be revised going forward. So that's another lesson that really comes out of this. And if I could add to that, a sure, couple of more are the, uh, the role of failure. Uh, most of these successes followed failures. And one of the problems... So it's not one thing, it's a continuum. That's exactly right. It's a continuum and it's a learning process. Mm -hmm. So most successful diplomats have learned to be successful out of a set of failures that they've experienced and learned from. And we need to develop, the business world has this, we need to develop in the international politics world an understanding of the importance of failure. And that failure should not be debilitating. Failure should enable us to learn and improve the next time. Are, are there barriers in the system to that for, for instance, a lack of continuity? New administration comes in, new people are appointed, and so the people who've learned from their mistakes aren't around. I think that's again. part of it. And the other is the kind of media scorecard we play. Who won, mm. who lost. Everything one of the, becomes a winner or a loss. Exactly. And one point we make in the book is that successful diplomacy is when everyone wins. Everyone doesn't get as much out of a deal, but you don't want your adversary in a deal, in a diplomatic arrangement to feel that they were taken advantage of because then the deal doesn't work. This is perhaps the most important but also the hardest lesson for Americans because we live in a competitive culture where right. you're expected to win all the time every time. In diplomacy the purpose is not necessarily victory it's to fashion a deal in which everyone walks away from the table satisfied that their country their cause was served. So candidate Trump would not like your book. <laughs> Probably <laughs> not. <laughs> he wants to win. Yeah, exactly. the, uh, what, 
Another question, if we were to do this, if you're going to start writing the book now, would the Iran nuclear deal make the cut? That's, do you consider that successful? Well, it's still early days. We sure. do, you know, we distinguish in the book between diplomatic success and successful diplomacy. What we really were focusing on is, is the behavior of statesmen and diplomats to bring about the outcome they aimed at. Mm -hmm. So it's still not quite in, in game time. in Iran, but so far it looks like it would be a, an excellent candidate for a case in successful diplomacy, uh, leaving aside the ultimate merits of the deal. The Cuba opening would be another mm -hmm. obvious case that would be interesting to study as a case in successful diplomacy. Are there examples within those, those two cases, Cuba and Iran, where the conclusions you've drawn, the lessons you've learned were put into practice? Absolutely. One of the big points we make in the book is that you're always playing a two-level game that you have to sell the deal internationally and you have to sell it at home and you have to think about that all the way through. The Obama administration obviously had to think about that with the Iran deal yeah. because they knew it was going to be a domestic uh, hotball and, and, they, and they thought that through. Another lesson is the mix of secrecy and openness. Right. In a democratic society, these deals have to be open to scrutiny by the legislature, by citizens, but to actually bring them to about requires a level of secrecy. So the secrecy involved in getting this far to the uh, negotiations with Iran and before that with Cuba were part of the uh, success of the operation. How does the diplomacy apply to non-state actors? We're used to negotiations between or conflicts between states. Now we're in an era where there are non-state actors that are major players. I think a lot of the same principles apply. I think one of the points we make is that you generally don't gain an advantage by not talking to someone. And by talking to them, you are not giving in to them nor legitimizing them. Talk is like oxygen. It is what fuels the international system. And so our argument in the book would be that we should think about diplomacy with the Taliban. We should think about diplomacy even with the Islamic State, not because we want to apologize, not because we don't want to use force, but because we can still gain things by talking with them and combining that talk with our use of force. And, and a final thought is uh, reception to the book. Uh, you want to reinvent diplomacy. Are the diplomats listening? Are the practitioners listening? They were listening a few hours ago. We were over at the <laughs> Department of State, and people found it really quite interesting. So we do want to reach practicing diplomats in our country and others. We want to reach students at the undergraduate level, graduate level, uh, so that they will be equipped with these kinds of skills as they move on into their careers, whether those are as diplomats, businessmen, lawyers, or, or, or whatever. Uh, we want to reach scholars as well to stimulate greater attention to this kind of research and scholarship so that we can have a better uh, capacity going forward. And, and we, we're doing that already. Uh, Ambassador Hutchings and I have taught together and actually our teaching in many ways is in the book. Uh, we have gone out and worked through, the, through our university and through other forums with sitting diplomats today and policymakers are trying to make this part of their professional development. And we're here at the Wilson Center for this yeah, reason. Yeah, another presentation coming up. Well, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Congratulations, terrific contribution to the discussion. And anyone who cares about these things should hope that diplomacy can succeed. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thanks, Thanks very, very much, John.